We're going to open the 3D LUT workflow. Color Cube 3D LUT. Start session. Since our meter was previously connected, it automatically reconnected. But if it if it didn't on your system, you would just hit find meter and then hit search. We are today calibrating um, a broadcast monitor that has an RGB LED backlight. So that's why we've selected RGB LED as our meter mode for the C6. Our source today is going to be DaVinci Resolve's built-in pattern generator. So in order to do that, we're going to go to find source, which is our pattern generator. Select DaVinci and the model's DaVinci Resolve pattern generator. We hit connect from the CalMAN side first, and then we note this IP address. And then when we go into DaVinci Resolve, which I'm going to do right now, we enter that IP address. So now we're going to go into DaVinci Resolve. We're going to go to the color tab in Resolve, go up to the color menu, go down to monitor calibration, select SpectraCal CalMAN, and now we will enter that IP address and we will hit connect. Now that the three zeros show up, that's our RGB triplet, it's just sending all black. You have to leave resolve in, the, in this screen. You can't hit close. You just have to leave this window open and now go back to CalMAN, which is now connected source DaVinci Resolve pattern generator. And since we're using a broadcast LCD monitor, we're gonna use full size patterns. The only time you would use window patterns would be on an OLED, plasma, or CRT. Now we're going to find our 3D LUT device, which is going to be the SpectraCal Cube Generator. We will select Manufacturer SpectraCal, and then the model is Cube Generator 3D LUT, and hit Connect. Now we can go to Next. Here is when we specify what our color space and gamma targets are and white point target. The display we're going to calibrate right now, we're targeting Rec. 709. So we have D65 HD Rec. 709, and we're going to use the BT1886 gamma formula. We'll go to next. And now we will do our pre-calibration measurements. And this will show us what the display is right now. So then we can look at a, a little bit of a before and after at the end. I will hit the read series button and it will take a series of measurements measuring the grayscale and the color gamut. Nice thing about this is that well, you're able to collect some data just to see if the display even needs a calibration LUT in the first place. Um, obviously you want to apply a LUT if it needs one, but let's say it was maybe recently calibrated by someone else in, uh, in the department and so you just wanted to check to see if it needs to be done. If this comes out good then you can you can wrap up and, and use the display for the work that you're uh, you're trying to accomplish. If not then you go through the process and, and make a correction LUT. So it looks like it's only got a couple more points of reading. This is the color checker series of readings. It's also doing the grayscale. Um, there's an in-depth video that goes into color checker so if you want to learn more about all these color points, um, the settings on this page, what the charts and graphs mean, um, you, can, you can go watch that. It's on our YouTube page on the Color Checker series. It's really helpful. If you haven't seen it yet, we recommend you do so. And looks like we're all set up. On the next page, we have a series of red and green dots. Since our white delta E is up to 12, it's suggesting that we should optimize our RGB balance in the monitor itself before we create the 3D LUT. All the rest of them are green. So instead of hitting Calibrate Cube LUT, we would hit the Optimize Display button. And it will take us through a series of steps to optimize the display. We have covered this in a previous webinar that we did just before this one. And we covered the whole setting up a display and adjusting it in anticipation of applying a 3D LUT. So we're just going to skim the surface of this process. Right here, this is mainly if you're calibrating a client monitor that is 
a consumer device that has picture modes. Most broadcast monitors don't have picture modes. They just have color space settings. So this really doesn't apply to us right now. This display doesn't have picture modes. It has presets and it's already set to 6500. So we just need to tweak the cuts and gains to optimize it before we build the 3D LUT. This is our dynamic range page. It's to check for clipping. On our previous webinar, we've noticed that this display clips anything at 235 or reference white, 940 and 10-bit range, and there's nothing we can do about it. This is just inherent in how this display works. Now I'm going to measure and adjust the RGB cuts and gains in this display to optimize it before doing the 3D LUT. I'm going to take a series reading. It's going to read 100% white and 30% gray. So this tells us that it has too much blue and it's deficient in red and green on the high end and it's the same on the low end, not as bad. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and reduce blue and maybe reduce red down to the green level. Essentially we want them all even with each other. So the way I like to do it is I do one at a time. I'll put it on the high measurement by clicking this patch down here and hitting our read continuous button that looks like an infinity symbol. And that will just read over and over so I can real time adjust the RGB gains control until I bring our delta E as low as possible, which is this chart. We want this as low as possible. So now it's reading in continuous mode and I'm going to bring up the menu on this display. And I'm going to reduce the blue gain. Now I'm going to reduce the red gain. I think it's important to note here too that on the RGB balance chart, the goal is to have the red, green, and blue columns line up with the 100 because that's the target white point we're trying to adjust the red, green, and blue gains towards. Um, and as Tyler suggested, the point of the DE2000 chart is to reduce the amount of error. So. It's a process of watching the two at the same time while you're adjusting. And usually I try to avoid increasing any of the gains. I just try to reduce them because that can introduce even more clipping. So now that I've got red and green even with each other, I'm going to bring down blue a little bit more. And as Tyler suggested uh, with reducing the controls, when in doubt, definitely uh, turn down the settings. We've seen displays out there where um, they're already maxed out. So if you're seeing a deficiency in one of the channels of color, if you try and push it up and maybe it's at 50 and you try and push it up to 80 and you don't see any change, well, it's because it's already, already maxed out. Um, so when you're trying to balance the two, if you want a color to come up, you're better off bringing down the, the color that's, uh, that you have too much of. So now our Delta E is that point, it's almost too low to read, <laughs> point 0.8. Um, so now we just optimize this one. Now I'm going to do a read series again. Some displays are, are very interactive in their cuts and gains. Some are not so much, but essentially you have to might have to go back and forth a couple times because they do affect each other on some displays more than others, but they do interact with each other. So now I'm going to click the lower patch, which is 30% gray. Do a read series on that and repeat the same process. Except now I'm going to, I'm going to adjust the RGB low control, which might, which might be called offset or cut. It's interesting to see how much the, the 30% RGB balance actually was impacted by the adjustments that Tyler made at the top end. Um, so as you can see, it's really important not just to measure and adjust the top end and the low end and call it good. You always want to adjust the top end, balance it out roughly as close as you can, measure the low end, make adjustments, and then re-measure both to see how much the other points changed since they are interactive. So now that I got both of the delta E's under one, I'm going to remeasure, and I bet I'm going to have to retouch up the high one. So I, I pulled the green out of the high one. I mean, I pulled it out of the low one, and it brought it down out of the high one. So it looks like right now I'm probably going to decrease the blue 
and the red a little bit more on the high one and then decrease the green a little bit more on the low one. See what I'm doing? I'm leaving a little bit of too much green on the top end because then when I lower the green on the bottom end, it'll bring it down. So once you get the hang of this, you'll, you'll, you'll see what type of displays do this behavior and you'll kind of be able to look at the chart and know how much you need to change once you get a little bit more experience. And since every display is different in how it's handling the red, green, and blue channels going from black to white, <clears throat> you'll often have to uh, figure out the characterizations, the unique characterizations that each display technology has. Once you get the Delta E's under one for both of them, you should just stop there, let the 3D light do the rest. Okay, now I've got them both under one, so now I'm gonna move on. Our target luminance we want is 100 nits. It's a little bit lower, so I'm gonna turn up the backlight on this LCD a little bit so we can hit 100 nits. Usually when a 3D LUT is applied afterwards, it reduces it slightly, so I'm gonna go over a little bit, maybe put it at like 105, so then when the 3D LUT is applied, it will reduce it slightly and we'll, we'll end up around 100. That should be good. Now we're going back to the beginning. Retake our pre-calibration measurement, and then we can go to the next page and see our, our red and green stop and go lights and see if they're all green this time. Yeah, and since this is gonna take a few measurements, um, we're just gonna go ahead and speed up this section real quick. We'll come back when all the points are measured and complete. Now, all of our Lights are green, so now we can go and build the 3D LUT. So we'll click our Calibrate Cube LUT button. First, it's going to bring us to a 1D LUT ramp. This step right now only applies to devices that have 1D LUTs. We're just going to be loading a 3D LUT into Resolve, so we can skip this step. Now we're on our Calibrate 3D Cube page. We will hit the Auto Cal button. It will bring up our 3D LUT setup dialog box. Under File Format, we will select Blackmagic Design DaVinci Resolve. And if you want to specify a certain place to have the LUT written to a folder or say your desktop, you can click here and specify exactly where it'll go. If not, it'll just be in the SpectraCal LUT folder. We always recommend optimizing the pattern delay. What this does is it runs a series of measurements to figure out what the best delay is between when Calman sends Resolve a signal to display the pattern and when the pattern is actually rendered on the screen. If this delay is too short, then the pattern might not be fully rendered when the meter takes a reading. If it's too long, then we're just wasting time. And if you're doing a long IR profile, that can really add up if you add an extra half a second per reading and you're taking thousands of readings. So I'm going to run the pattern delay optimizer right now. It's going to do a series of measurements between green and magenta to optimize the pattern delay. After it's done determining the pattern delay, it also does a reading of all the grayscale points. This is because it's trying to determine what the actual read average time is so it can properly estimate the time it would take on an IR profile time-based LUT. In this case, it says it will take 71 minutes for a, a 2050 read 3D LUT. On most broadcast monitors, LCD and OLED our lightning LUT feature works exceptionally well, and that's what we're going to use today. So we're going to switch our calibration type to lightning LUT, and now we just hit OK, and it will take approximately between 65 and 75 readings, and it will build a complete 3D LUT. Now that Calman has started to generate the lightning LUT, we're going to let it go ahead and take all the measurement points it's doing and we'll come back when it's complete, which should probably be a little less than five minutes. All right, so it looks like we're all complete and we're, we finished just about around four minutes. Let's go ahead and see how this, uh, this LUT came out. Now we're going to look at our post calibration. The way DaVinci Resolve works is once you load a LUT, their pattern generator bypasses all LUTs. So the way we're going to verify it today is we're going to enable our virtual LUT, which pipes our pattern generator output 
through the LUT, which is essentially what Resolve does internally when it, it pipes the content through the LUT to your same monitor. We will click the Enable Virtual LUT and we run our read series. Another way we've heard some of our customers do this is they create a project file with uh, the same pattern images that they load into Resolve and then measure those patterns. It's essentially the same uh, process and function that we're doing now. We're using the virtual LUT just because it's completely automated and can do all the changes for you. Um, but since there isn't a ton of measurement points, you could actually pretty easily do this. We do have a project file that's for free. You can download it from our website if you like. Um, if you want to make your own, all the RGB triplet values are displayed right on screen. So you can just create your own image file and create your own project, load it in, and do the same test. Uh, if you want to just have that kind of concrete uh, comfort with, with knowing that the LUT has been applied properly to the display. And it looks like we've only got a couple points left. And we'll go ahead and let this finish up and we'll come back when it's done. Now that it's done, we can see our color checker delta E average of our gamut is 1, and the grayscale is 0.7. The maxed error, right in these orange and yellow areas, might be improved with an IRP LUT. If you didn't get expected results with the lightning LUT, then you can go back and do an IRP time or point based LUT to give it more data to generate the LUT from. We will now show you where to load the LUT into Resolve. Now that we've created our LUT, we're going to show you how to load it into DaVinci Resolve. This version is running on a Mac, but we'll show you a screenshot of where to load it in the Windows version. I've loaded it onto a thumb drive because the machine we were running Calman on was a separate machine. I'm going to copy our LUT, which is a .cube file. We go to our main drive, go into library, then go to application support, go to Blackmagic Design, DaVinci Resolve, and now to our LUT folder. And we will paste the item into our LUT folder. Now that I've copied our 3D LUT into the LUT folder, I need to restart Resolve so it will recognize the new LUT. Now that Resolve is back open, I will go to the project settings, go to the lookup table area of the settings. Under 3D video monitor lookup table, I will select our 3D LUT and we'll have whatever file name that Calman created or whatever file name that you created. I usually recommend naming them with what the display is and what the color space is of, of the 3D LUT. So then at a later date, you know exactly what that LUT is and what it's for. So now that it's selected, we'll hit apply. And now your newly created corrective 3D LUT is now applied to the output of your Blackmagic reference output device going to your reference monitor. Now we will show you where it's located on Windows version if you have Resolve running on Windows. And now I will show you where to load the LUT if you're running Resolve on Windows. The LUTs are stored in the Windows Program Data folder, which is actually a hidden folder, so unless you have hidden folders enabled, you won't be able to straight navigate to it using Windows Explorer. The easiest way to access this folder to load your lookup table created by Calman is to go to the Project Settings in Resolve in the Lookup Table area, and then hit the Open LUT Folder button. That will bring up a Windows Explorer window with the LUT folder and then you can just drag and drop your LUT that Kalman created into that folder.